15 prime ministers have led the UK government since Queen Elizabeth's ascension to the throne in 1952, starting with Winston Churchill and ending just two days before she died with Liz Truss. During her 70-year-plus reign, the Queen held weekly audiences with all of them. I spoke today with former Prime Minister Gordon Brown about his relationship with the Queen and how she would be remembered. Gordon Brown, it is such a pleasure to have you here, even uh, during these sad times, but it is time to celebrate Her Majesty the Queen. You knew her for so many years, first as a member of Parliament, when she came to Scotland. Yeah, I first uh, met the Queen in 1983, when she came to visit my constituency, when I was a member of Parliament. But of course, I met her every week uh, for more than an hour uh, when I was Prime Minister, and I also met her when I was Chancellor of the Exchequer. And you know, never in our history has there been such an outpouring of grief and sadness at the death of uh, a monarch and at the death of someone who was loved by the whole public. There are tears, but there's also thankfulness at the great service she gave to her country. You know, and when I met the Queen, you, you, you know that she was considerate, she was incredibly generous, uh, very kind indeed, very well informed. Uh, I had to report on the budget, of course, and what we were doing in terms of finances, but she, she was very, very well up on all these uh, details, particularly what was happening in the rest of, rest of the world. And she had this tremendous sense of duty, a commitment to public service, and she had pledged herself at the age of 21 that whatever happened, she would devote her life to the country. And she had an incredible sense of humor. You know, uh, I uh, remember having to report to her that we, we couldn't afford a new royal yacht. You and couldn't afford to replace the Britannia. We, we couldn't afford to, and we didn't want it to be sponsored by Enron or Gazprom or someone. So, and, and then, of course, we couldn't, um, we couldn't couldn't uh, afford another proposal that one of her family had for a royal uh, air fleet because we said we've got the Royal Air Force. She was having trouble because she had a royal train and there was all these permissions she had to get to get from London right up to the north of Scotland. And then suddenly she said to me, I think we should just get a royal bus. <laughs> that, a was royal a, bus. <laughs> that was that was her humour. I remember also, uh, you know, when you met uh, the Queen, you said Your Majesty and then you said Ma'am throughout the, throughout the meeting. But Nelson Mandela, who was also a great friend of mine, as well as hers, he used to tell me, he would just walk and say, hello, Elizabeth, how's the Duke? <laughs> and that was how he greeted her. Hello, that. Elizabeth, how's the Duke? That, that was Nelson, <laughs> Nelson yeah, Mandela. That's amazing. I remember also my, 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 ch my children, they, they met the Queen for the first time at, at Balmoral, and they were very young at that time, both under five, and she was walking out and was being introduced to them for the first time, and her corgis were with us, and one of them was yelping and barking, and she said, shut up, and my kids forevermore said, well, if the Queen can say shut up, can we <laughs> say shut up? But these were her first words. I, she had a tremendous sense of humor. But what shines through everything is this incredible duty, sense of obligation to the country, desire to be a public servant. And though she was above us, she was alongside us. Uh, and I think uh, she would like herself to be remembered as a, as a person who served the country right until the last, because there are pictures of her the Tuesday before she died on the Thursday, meeting the new prime minister and saying goodbye to the old prime minister. And she did it with such dignity, and, and she clearly was not well at that time. You know, I had the privilege of once being at Balmoral, as you know, and certainly watching the the rites in Scarlet in Scotland, um, the incredible procession, the outpouring of people. It was just so clear that there was a special bond between her and Scotland, and the fact that she went to Balmoral in Scotland for every vacation. She didn't you know, yeah. holiday around the world. Well, she, she loved Scotland, and uh, she, um, if, if you remember when the Duke of Edinburgh died, her husband, the one photograph she issued as a sort of her public uh, uh, demonstration of grief was a photograph of her with him at Balmoral, on the hills of Balmoral. And she used to spend six weeks uh, there. She interrupted the holiday by inviting every prime minister there. Uh, and uh, Tell me about that, because yeah. I've heard that she actually served the, the barbecue. Yes, uh, uh, what she did was she organized a barbecue for every prime minister, and uh, she would drive you there herself because it was uh, a bit of a way from the, the, the castle. How was she behind the wheel? She, she was very good behind the wheel, but we had to open and close gates between different parts of the, the estate. So we were getting out of the car and into the car, and she was driving on. And then, of course, we arrived at the barbecue, and suddenly we saw that the Duke of Edinburgh was cooking the food, and, and she was about to set the table, and then uh, she was washing the dishes afterwards. Mrs. Thatcher, who was uh, astounded about this, sent her a pair of 
rubber gloves for Christmas because she thought she was also astonishing. <laughs> uh, and of course, you offered to help, and of course, there, there was uh, she was in, she was determined to do it herself. Now, uh, and that that was how considerate she was, and she made you feel at home by bringing other guests that she knew you would like. There was a book in your room that she had chosen specially from her library for you to read, and that that was the the kindness and uh, generosity and the considerate nature that, that that she had. And yet she was presiding over huge changes that were taking place in, in our country. You know, she's the longest-serving monarch, uh, seven, 71 one years. And Queen Elizabeth I was only 45 years, I think. Uh, um, uh, Queen Victoria, 50 years. King George III, 60 years. And she's 70 years, the longest-serving. But of course, it's the quality she brought to, to the job. And at the time that she was uh, queen, we were not an expanding empire, as Britain was in the 19th century under Queen Victoria. The empire was becoming the Commonwealth, and she eased the transition, uh, and she made it a lot smoother than it would otherwise have been because of her diplomatic skills. And so the Commonwealth of Nations now is two and a half billion people. It's 56 countries, and it's included countries that were never part of the British Empire, like Mozambique and Rwanda and so on. And that's really a tribute to her own uh, sense that Britain could still have a role in the world, even if it wasn't an imperial role. How do you imagine the transition will be? Certainly, King Charles has shown a great deal of empathy in the last days, but he doesn't have the popularity, no one could, of this monarch. Well, I think she set down the foundations that he is determined to follow. And I, I noticed that he was uh, saying that I'm, he's giving up on some of the interests that he had. He understands that it's a dignified constitution. In other words, that he cannot involve himself in the day-to-day -day politics. These are decisions, as he said, are for Parliament and for the Prime Minister and for the cabinet and not for him. But I think he will spend a lot of time traveling the world because uh, these 56 countries in the Commonwealth, you've got Australia thinking it might want to be a republic. You've got the Caribbean countries that have got, still got the monarchy that may want to become republics. And I think we've got to say to them, look, if that's what you want to do, that's your decision, but we still want to have the friendliest relationships. And I think he will have to spend a, a lot of time talking to people in these countries because if you break uh, the, from the monarchy and it's done in a, in a way that is, uh, if you like, uh, bitter, that would be a terrible thing to happen. Well, a great legacy, and your recollections are so extraordinary. The longest-serving chancellor of the Exchequer ever in British history, and, of course, a prime minister as well, and someone who knew the Queen for some 40 years. Thank you so much, Gordon Brown. I know you'll be at the funeral on Monday. Yes, thank you.